Anyway, I wanted to talk to you today um, about uh, a few things. They're all obviously related. Um, uh, you know, what's happened since October 7th, the current massacre happening in Gaza, but also the, the silencing of uh, the internal critics um, in Israel, both in Palestine, the West Bank, and in 48 Israel itself. Um, I wanted to start by um, by asking you how how did you how did you learn about in a way what happened in October seventh and what was your your first kind of reaction to it? Well, I have family in uh, Kibbutz Beiri, and uh, when we learned about it, you know, like everybody else through the media. I called them and my cousin said, we are hiding. We talked a little bit and then she said, they're shooting around the house. I have to stop. And then we, you know, we texted each other for the whole day. They were there for like 30 hours. With no electricity, no water, nothing. And uh, they were saved. But a lot of friends were killed. I know a lot of people there. I'm sorry to hear that. I, I actually, I didn't, I didn't know about that. And um, and once, I mean, I'm not sure if you had had time since then because it just didn't stop to actually take a, a pose or, or 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 to start to breathe a bit. But once you you had the chance to do that, what did you think? How did you feel? Because I mean, it was like no one expected this to happen, right? Uh, I think many people expected it to happen. I think the um, uh, the writing was on the wall. Uh, the government was warned by the army, by the, the you know the intelligence, by the people who lived them themselves, who saw preparations and so on. But the government chose to ignore it. Not only that, they took the army out of this border, and they took most of the weapons from the units inside the kibbutzim who were supposed to guard the places. And this happened a very short time before the attack. They took him to the West Bank to secure the pogromist uh, settlers um, in the Palestinian occupied territories. So I don't think it was a surprise to everybody. Uh, now, um, what I saw, well, I tell you what happened to me. Um, people started right away to compare uh, the Palestinians to Nazis. And uh, as usual, when Palestinians react in a violent way to the occupation in Israel, they present it as anti Semitic, heinous crimes against helpless Jews forgetting that we are a nuclear power uh, with one of the strongest armies in the world and about the occupation. So somebody wrote in a closed WhatsApp group of the college where I work, they showed a video uh, published by uh, a university professor where he explains very academically why the Hamas are like Nazis. And I responded that they are not like Nazis because Nazism is a ideology that serves a state with an army that decided to exterminate uh, minorities. And then I said, maybe we should um, um, compare them to other occupied uh, uh, people like the Algerians, for example, and I quoted Jean Paul Sartre, who said that after years and years that you, the heel of your shoes, of your boots was on the neck, suddenly they are given a chance to raise their heads and look at you. What kind of look do you think you will find there? And I ended by saying, this is the look we saw on the 7th of October. I was immediately suspended from uh, the college. And now uh, the good thing is that uh, most of the lecturers uh, stood up for me and for freedom of speech. And 
it goes on everywhere in Israel, everywhere, in supermarkets, in universities, in hospitals, on the bus, in the street. Uh, there is a atmosphere of uh, McCarthyism. People are afraid to talk, Jews, but mostly Arabs, mostly Arabs. And, um, and this is it. But I really think that this was, you know, a, a revolt against occupation, a very ugly, cruel, ferocious revolt, but sometimes revolts are like that. And of course, those who pay the price are not those who have to pay the price. You know, in a way, everything you've just said makes total sense. But we live in a time where being rational uh, and trying to understand how October 7th could have happened um makes you um as you know turns you into a monster you yes. cannot say this you know for a lot of people in the media in governments uh, and and a lot of activists are, fa are facing this trying to understand something means you you agree with it justify it yes right if you understand it you justify it and um well, this is the, 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 the this is the, the demagogy of, of of these people, yes. And I was accused by the president of my college for feeling empathy with murderers and for justifying uh, their crimes and so on and so forth. Yes, of course. This is how you silence people. And, and but the fact is that if you do not try to understand where this is coming from, you're never going to find the solution to the problem. That's right. That's right. Exactly. That's right. Yes. People yeah. don't want a solution. They want, I don't know what they want. They want blood. That's what they want. And they don't see that these same people who have subjugated and oppressed and tortured and killed the Palestinians will be happy to do it to them if it serves their interests. It is I, again, they yeah. and us. Yeah. No, again, I, 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 I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. But and that's why, you know, everything that is happening right now in in Gaza, in the West Bank, in Israel itself, doesn't really make any sense because it, it, it only sort of, you know, gears us towards. An even more violent future. Yes, as long as somebody profits from it, and a lot of people profit from it. Okay, and thing, and yeah. a profitable business. Another thing I wanted to talk to you about because, like, you, you've mentioned it already, but what's hap what's happening now in Gaza? The annihilation of a people, a genocide, uh, moaning the lawn. You know the expression the Israeli army uses cannot happen without first making like dehumanizing the palestinian completely of course through propaganda through lies you you've actually written a book that that Two books so, yeah i mean <laughs> the last one, of one just came out just came okay out. <laughs> i need to get it so the one I, I i talked about i talk about is the one called palestine in israeli school books ideology of propaganda in education right can you briefly t talk to to me about what while reading the book researching the book you found about 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 that okay um uh, as you said in order to annihilate people you have to dehumanize them and convince your own uh, audience and your own taxpayers that they deserve it so there are a few stages of doing this. Zygmunt Bauman uh, wrote about it uh, in relation to, to, to the propaganda against the Jews. But it, uh, it applies to every propaganda and dehumanization of people. So first of all, you make an abstraction out of them. They don't exist. Palestinians don't exist in Israeli consciousness, in Israeli culture, or in Israeli education. They are just some kind of a very remote, um, amorphic um, enemy, danger, threat, terrorism. And uh, 
in all Israeli school books, and there are hundreds of them, you don't find one photo of a Palestinian human being. You find uh, uh, racist uh, representations of caricatures of Alibaba and um, camel, primitive farmers following oxen or terrorists. Never a teacher, a writer, a child, nothing. So they don't exist. They de exist only as a threat. Now, as a threat or developmental uh, problem, as they say, or demographic threat, um, they must be confined. They must be distanced. And this legitimates the occupation and the military government and so on. And then, since they are such a terrible problem, why not kill them? Why not eliminate them? Uh, Bauman calls it the gardening metaphor. He says, on the way to a perfect nation state, uh, the state is uh, is treated like a garden. You have to pluck out all the all the bad weeds, and they are the bad weeds. So I think this, and now I'm going to my next book. This, when it is uh, accompanied by a very aggressive, traumatizing Holocaust education in Israel, uh, serves to to. Um, to perpetuate revenge, but the revenge is not against the Germans. We are friends with the Germans. It's against the potential exterminators who are the Palestinians. And if you listen to, to speeches by the prime minister on Holocaust day, they always conflate Palestinians and Arabs in general with the Nazis. And then the children of, at the age of 16 uh, are going to Auschwitz and Treblinka uh, wrapped with an Israeli flag, and they come back full of zeal, full of zeal to kill. And this education uh, really prepares them to see every Palestinian, no matter what age, as a threat to be killed. Now, if you read the Confessions of uh, Soldiers in Breaking the Silence book, you see that many of them say the same thing. They say, I was educated to believe that everything I do to Palestinians will prevent another Holocaust. Only when my rifle was aimed at a little girl did I understand who is evil and who is... So this education is so strong and so sophisticated. For example, I give you an example. Uh, in 2020, this is the last one that I checked, a history book that prepares a student for a matriculation it has a chapter, and also in the exam, it was the same thing, uh, that's called the Formation of Holocaust Remembrance. And in this chapter, they tell you about Palestinian terrorist actions in Munich, in Antebbe, in here and there, and they say these actions made it easier for Israelis to identify with Holocaust survivors. So this kind of nazification. Now, all these terrorist attacks that were in response to occupation are presented again as anti-Semitic, heinous crimes out of the blue against innocent Jews. Whether soldiers or not soldiers, they are all our children, our innocent children. And this is on matriculation. Like this is the, you know, this is the resume of everything they've learned. Uh, so on one hand, there is dehumanization, racism, when you treat all the Arabs like Alibaba with a camel. And there are texts, of course, accompanying it, that they cannot, that they don't like progress, they are afraid to be modernized, and so on and so forth. And the Nazification, on the other hand, of these people. And this is a wonderful preparation, a very successful one, as we see, to what we see is happening both on the West Bank and, and in the army and so on. And it's very hard for people to get rid of that. Very hard. I mean, it, it's it's mad, you know. It's so entrenched. It's um, yes. like people are brainwashed for such an early age. Uh, it's it's um, yeah. But but as you you said, it's uh, it's on purpose. You know, it's a program. Oh it's yes, yes, yes. Dynamic, yes. And, uh, you know. you, we also have all kinds of documents that say we have to punch them in the guts, we have to keep the fire of revenge alive, and so on and so forth. These are documents from the Ministry of Education. How do you react when a lot of people compared October 7th to uh, to the Holocaust, 
or a second Holocaust. Well, that's what I said. I said it's more likely like like the Algerians when they got a chance to 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 get even with the French. They weren't nice. They were horrible. But it, this is it, because they are not a state. They don't have an army. We are not a hope a helpless minority under the rule. It's not Nazism. It's something else. It's terrible. It's horrible. It, but it's something else. Especially when we are so busy in annihilating a whole society. As uh, you remember in the uh, Russell Tribunal, there was this uh, sociologist, Galtung, Johan, Johan Galtung, he called it sociocide. He said, let's not call it genocide, but we can easily call it sociocide. And this is what we are doing. Uh, you know, like uh, I've, I've been thinking a lot in the last few days and I've been talking to many friends, you know, Palestinians, Israelis, Europeans. And um, I was wondering how it was possible for a country. I mean, it's not all every Israelis, but the majority of the country and an army to to massacre children and stuff and to, in a way, be proud of it. You've mentioned why through propaganda and make, you know, the Palestinians are rats, animals. But I was thinking maybe it goes even further than that because, you know, the original lie was a land without a people for people without a land. But everybody knew it was a lie because when they got to Palestine, they realized there were people, there were markets, there were trains. So don't you think that the fact that in a way, the Zionist project wants the land without the people. But even after, like, since 48, so it's been, whatever, you know, 70 years, 80 years, the Palestinians are still on the land is what drives the yes. Israelis crazy. Um, this phrase, the, this saying, uh, land without people for people without land, was meant um, the worthy people, not you know, all colonialists, when they came to India, to Africa, thought there was nobody there, okay, except for those barbarians. So th this was it. It's not that they thought there were no human beings there. There were, but, you know, who cares? They are not worthy of, of attention, and they have to thank us for cultivating them and so on. So this was the, the, the purpose of this, uh, of this uh, phrase. Uh, yes, and as I said, they don't exist. When you talk, for example, about Israeli culture, Palestinian Israeli writers, poems, musicians are not included in this discourse, although they are Israeli. When you talk about Israeli science, you don't mention Palestinian Israeli scientists and so on. So they, I think they, they have succeeded very well to create um, an atmosphere where these people, although they are there, do not exist. That's the point. And whenever we acknowledge someone's existence by smiling or giving him a glass of water and so on, we feel so noble. Okay? And uh, it's, it's a huge success. And I think uh, if we look at colonialist regimes, this is what they did. I mean, the British in India did not consider the Indians uh, worthy of attention or worthy of anything. What, they were there to serve, but they were not there as people. And uh, it's the same thing here, it's the same thing here. And if they are on the land and they are an obstruction, you have to get rid of them somehow. And everybody accepts it, that's the point. I've got a final question. It's not really a question, and we might, we probably won't be able to answer it. But where do we go now? I mean, now, obviously, we have to stop the massacre. There has to be a ceasefire, and then it has, you know, other things need to happen, you know. But I mean, I'm talking to a lot of activists say, you know, this is going to change everything. And I remind them that in 2008, 2009, after Operation Cast Lead, we said the same thing. And in 2012, and in 14, and in 20, and in 16, we said the same thing. Israel went too far. This is going to change everything. This time, obviously, it's bigger than it's, it's ever been. Yes. But how how do we how do we make sure that this changes everything? And what does it mean? Well, I think that what has to be changed is the definition of camps. 
when you say we, who are we? Okay. We. For me, we are all those who suffer from the occupation, all those who lost children and family and so on and so forth, all those who really want it to end. And we don't have the power to uh, to beat uh, Israeli uh, army or Israeli state with the $11 million a day that Americans give them. Uh, the only thing we can do for us, and it's really poor us, is to create some alternative world where our we is constituted there. There's nothing we can do otherwise except refuse. Uh, I think one of the things that education has not uh, uh, paid attention to is that children must learn to refuse to disrespect unworthy author authority. You know, there is a grade for respect for authority. Disrespect authority, refuse, refuse orders. Refuse people who are not worthy to be listened and obeyed to. This is something we haven't educated children ever. So if we can create this alternative world with this we, this other we, we must uh, educate the children otherwise with another hierarchy. Who is worthy of my trust? Who is worthy of my obedience and who is not? And today with the... Uh, Old paradigms, it doesn't work anymore. I mean, we are ruled by a criminal and a bunch of criminals. And still people obey them, you know? People obey them. Nobody goes and just throw them away physically. You know, there were stories, amazing stories about fathers and grandfathers uh, on, on October 7th who just put on their uniform, their old uniform, took their gun and went and saved their children and friends from the burning villages and kibbutzim. Why can't they throw these people away? But they wouldn't dare. You see, it's very strong, this, this, this education for obedience. They think this is one of the facets of democracy, but there's no democracy in this place. It has to be like, I don't know, like in Romania, like in Czechoslovakia, something very drastic. Um, I don't know. I don't see anybody who is doing it in Israel because they are all more or less, all the leaders are all more or less like Bibi, you know, less corrupt, more corrupt. But the the, the ideology and, and the conception that we have to crush them, that you have to punish them, that you have to take revenge is on everybody's lips. Uh, maybe except for really the Arab leaders like Ayman Ode, for example, and Ahmed Tibi, and these people who have never killed anybody in their lives and are talking differently. But again, they are Arabs, and it will take a long time till people listen to them. I would be very happy to see them in power. Nurit, uh, I, I cannot thank you enough uh, for these last, um, whatever, 30 minutes. Yeah. Thank you, Nurit. Um, Thank you very much. And uh, we'll speak soon. Enjoy, enjoy uh, Portugal. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Nurit. Bye -bye.